Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is near insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. Listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslivers.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting the danger. Unafraid. Right here where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. And with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way, I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other world. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. It's a great honor to be with you again. Um, I appreciate all of you taking the time to be with us. It's been certainly a trying week for those that don't know my Good friend Rob Skiba uh, passed away um, last Wednesday, and it's been a been a trying time for those of us in the alternative truth community that were um, real close with Rob, and and certainly myself. I considered him a really really good friend and somebody that I worked closely with in collaboration on shows and bringing forth truth and um, in the the spirit of that truth and seeking truth and bringing it forth in disclosure. Uh, my son is joining me this evening and we are beginning a new series on chapter by chapter, verse by verse, introspection of the book of Revelation, which I thought would be very appropriate uh, those of you that 
follow our work know that we have for a very long time been doing a prophecy in the news show and current events as it aligns with biblical prophecy. And so this will be a change of pace and also still along the lines of that particular narrative and perspective. And uh, we've been actually asked to do this and actually uh, a few uh, people had asked Rob and I to do this a long time ago. And it was something that we actually talked about, um, but of course we didn't, did not have the chance. And so I feel that, you know, it would be a great blessing for my son to join me in this endeavor and for us to be able to begin this new series and covering the end, which I believe certainly that um, we are the fig tree generation and that we are living in the time of the end. Um, and I think that people, even those that were doubters and, you know, did not believe uh, that the times are certainly forcing us to reconsider um, all that we thought we knew. And so I thought it would be a good thing for us to, to do this. And my son did uh, suggest it to me earlier. And so here we are. Justin, are you there, son? Yes, I am here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It was a really beautiful, nice day. The weather is supreme and, you know, um, just getting the chance to hang out with my cats and enjoy this time and space is, uh, it's been tremendously healing and, um, and, you know, all the outreach people really thanking us for all that we did before and having the, the chance to kind of settle down and to get back into routine. Um, that's also been a blessing, but I do look forward to, you know, going into this particular um, subject matter and this particular teaching. And I did pull up some other extra biblical texts in the, the manner that Rob and I used to do when we were doing the Genesis Revisited series. Um, and the book, The Great Commission 3, which is a, a focus on the end time narrative. I, I did bring up a, a few pieces from some of those manuscripts to share as well as we go through uh, Revelation. So, but um, you can comment and anything that you'd like to share, and then we can go ahead and go into the, the subject matter. And I thought you could start with um, you know, the reading as far as the King James, and then um, afterward, I'll, I can go into some of this other material as well. Sounds good. Well, I want to welcome everybody who is joining in the YouTube live stream. This is a continuation of our normal show on current events and Bible prophecy study. But uh, as you know, if you've joined along in the past, we really focus on current events quite a lot and uh, I think that we covered you know everything that's going on so much that I don't know it's just kind of depressing when you just focus on current events so much you know so I guess reading through this it might it might be a little bit depressing as well when you learn of all the judgments <laughs> that are going to come on the earth but the great part is that eventually we're going to get and we're going to see the end you know and that you know, so we're, we're making progress here, and we are starting our study in the book of Revelation. This is a study that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Of course, I remember, you know, when I was young and when I first came to knowledge of the Messiah and faith in, in him and his sacrifice on the cross, and I was living with you, and I remember during your bath times, you know, you take a long bath and you blast your radio yeah. right and every <laughs> every night it was always revelation the book of revelation was always playing you know 
And I remember, you know, we, I, myself, I've probably yeah, I wanted to memorize read through it, it a lot of times, time. but <laughs> I think that you've probably listened to it like a thousand times or something, you know? Right. It's right, kind of crazy. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm excited to go through verse by verse. And this is, you know, in the spirit of, of the show that you used to do with Rob, going through Enoch and Genesis verse by right. verse. And, you know, last Wednesday we did basically finish up Genesis chapter 30, I mean chapter 50, and, uh, you know, closing right. closing out that study in Genesis. And uh, what better way to, to go? <laughs> you know, Rob used to always tell people, why why would you take out half of the book, you know? And, and you just have the New Testament. We've basically taken out 64 books now, and we've skipped from book one to book number 66 in the canon. We went from <laughs> right. the very beginning to the very end here. But this is going to be a, a really great study, and I'm really excited. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone on Revolution Radio, for you know being here and supporting the, the project here. You know, freedom of speech is something that is hard to come across these days. Hey, just touch on a little bit of current events. I don't know if you've seen Biden the past two, like, you know, hokey pokey, uh, whatever speeches, I guess you can call them speech, when he reads off of the teleprompter. He keeps saying, <laughs> freedom, this isn't about your freedom. This isn't about freedom. And, I, you know, you just keep thinking, right, this is no longer the land of the free. I mean, it hasn't been, right? Right, right. Relatively, we've had relative freedom, but those freedoms are being detracted. They've been being detracted continually. And then he came back on when he's talking about making all the children do the hokey pokey dance, right? And he's right. like, it's not about freedom. Like, don't give me that freedom nonsense. You know what? You have the freedom to kill me with your C-19? You're like, What? Right. Uh, and that that's the logic on uh, you know right. i'm not right or left i think that we are unplugged from the spectrum right but but that's mm -hmm. like leftist logic <laughs> is that tied to Ob terror, obama right. said people who refuse to do the hokey pokey dance are the same as suicide bombers uh -huh, right and that's that. That's what we're being looked at. I mean, I, I honestly, right. I feel like that's a large reason why the hospital treated Rob so badly and led to this yeah. this outcome, right? Right. Because yeah. he didn't want to do the hokey pokey dance. How horrible right. is that? So, right. I digress. Yeah. It Let's is. stay on the subject matter at hand, right? But we do touch on current events still. But did you want to comment on that, and then we can move into yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, this is a, a subject matter which we have to be very careful in speaking about because we have been already flagged and uh, had the the channel put at risk because of our coverage and our speaking of truth on this matter. Uh, but the fact is, yeah, we, you know, our friends, our family members, everybody, uh, their lives are at risk because a lot of people are just simply not knowledgeable on the time in advance and the dangers um, facing that they're facing and how the enemy is working. Um, because, you know, again, as we covered many times in doing shows on the Illuminati protocols and secret covenant, uh, this is nothing new that they have been speaking about and orchestrating and planning to orchestrate uh, the scenario for the Hegelian dialectic, the problem reaction solution, that they would create the problem, that they would also offer the solution, and that solution would serve their agenda at the same time as guising it, dressing it up in um, something that would be beneficial for those that participate, that take part in, and that this is the propaganda, uh, this is the, you know, what is going on, that they have twisted information and twisted the reality of 
what is going on to such a degree that people think that to do and to get involved and to participate it would be beneficial for themselves and now you know the whole threat is to the children the, that they are targeting uh, kids five to eleven years and um, and it's good to at least see some people some parents standing up and you know trying to fight for at least their their right to choose their right to decide uh, for their their loved ones and not have uh, outside forces you know come in and declare that you have to uh, you don't have a choice and that yeah, you, you know look out now though. just get in line yeah you might be labeled a domestic terrorist right exactly and that's exactly what you know they have been doing even with the the passing of the patriot act of how they have made and misconstrued Christians and patriots and turned us and you know people that uh, are constitutionalists into the enemies of state. Uh, you know, whereas whistleblowers that supported bringing forth corruption in government used to be celebrated as heroes. Uh, now you like you know the Edward Snowden, uh, you. You really putting your life at risk um, in blowing the whistle on anything. Whistleblowers are now criminals, and um, it's unfortunate. But you know things are just upside down now, and that's exactly what Scripture tells mm -hmm. us that these times uh, would be turned upside down, so that good would be evil and evil good. Yeah, it's it's crazy. The people that expose evil. Are the ones that get in trouble, right? Right. Yeah, it, you just can't get through the logic here. I can't comprehend the logic, and I think I personally think that it's just because there is no logic. Right. You know, like right. ask any anyone who supports hokey mandating you do do the hokey pokey dance, right? Ask them. Does the hokey pokey dance prevent me from doing the C-19 dance? Does it prevent me from spreading the C-19 dance? Uh, no. No, it does not prevent transmission. I'm not a healthcare professional. That's common knowledge. Right. The, this thing, the dance was created not to prevent transmission. So why in the world am I more of a threat than somebody who's doing the dance? Right. You know, we're, we're all and they actually potential the carriers, right? Right. Yeah. Hey. yeah, those that have done the dance, uh, they are actually more of a threat to those of us that haven't. But, you know, they think it the opposite uh, manner. But, you know. Yeah, uh, it's really crazy. But, you know, this... This ties in perfectly well with Revelation, right? Yes. I mean, maybe yes. not tonight's study, but eventually when we get there, eventually, Revelation 13, right. it's it's going to it's starting to all really tie together. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but I do think we should um, go ahead and get in with the this study. Just you know, we're already being flagged for all that stuff. But um, and we'll have time to to comment, and we'll you know we have time to really take our time to go through. And if you have questions in the chat room, um, feel free to ask. Uh, Justin does a better job of monitoring uh, that kind of stuff than I do, um, and so you might actually get <laughs> some answers, or we'll be able to share your commentary. Yeah, as long as we try to avoid those keywords, hopefully we'll be Yes, yes. Okay, but yeah, I am you know, monitoring the chat. It's always great to see you. Tammy, thank you so much for your work in the yes. chat. Molive, thank yes. you. It's Appreciate good to see you, you brother. Yes, Molive. Uh, yes, and we are praying Lisa, for you deeply, thank brother. You. Thank you all to the mods and thank you everybody else who are just joining in. Uh, I will try to keep up with the chat tonight. But all right, so we can go ahead and get started with the revelation 
of Jesus Christ. And I, I pray that none of you are offended when I say Jesus Christ. It's simply a transliteration of the name, the Hebrew name of the Messiah that I believe is pronounced Yahusha, but I'm not dogmatic yes. because I don't speak Hebrew and I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, so I don't I don't really right. know. But uh, I know in Korea, my my Korean family call me Chosatin, you know, and I don't get offended when they call me Chosatin because uh -huh. that's the... Uh, sorry, Anomalous, I didn't mean to hide that comment. All right, anyways... The revelation of Jesus Christ. And I think that we should just go verse by verse. Yes, absolutely. We can just discuss verse by verse. So yeah. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. What do you think about that? Um, I will, of course, you know, John... On exiled on the Isle of Patmos, he was um, the last remaining apostle alive. Uh, and you know, in the study that we did previously, um, going through the the testaments, or maybe it was the Great Commission. I think it was the Great Commissions, actually, uh, the Acts and the Gospels of the Apostles in Book One and Two. We see that John was actually poisoned, and that. The poison did not work on him, um, and that you know this was the reason why he was also exiled. But that he had survived many attempts on his life, and um, and so this is now, you know, he's receiving what would become the warning for us as to the time of the end. In the same manner that you know the apostles, when even before. Yahushua had been uh, crucified and died and ascended up into heaven. Well, of course, he went down into Sheol and took Adam and his descendants back up to the Father as the first fruits of the resurrected dead. But um, he, he was given the vision for us, uh, and they asked him, you know, what would be the time uh, of his, what would be the signs of the end? end of the age and of his return, the second advent, because they knew that he was coming again to redeem us uh, as humanity and that he would restore things back to an eternal age where there was no longer any suffering, any death, any uh, crying, any pain, any uh, aging, you know, any getting older, any bodily breakdown that we would be in a glorified form which did not have to experience any of those things which are connected to mortality and to flesh embodiment and that would be a return to our first estate and a return to our bright nature of which adam and eve were created and given in a mortal embodiment before their fall from paradise and before they took on uh, mortal embodiment, were placed under the authority of death. All right, that was a great <laughs> uh, addition and insight into the verse. But uh, just going back to the verse, it says, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. So this, you know, some people will say this, is a defense of preterism, right? That right. all of Revelation has already occurred. But if you read towards the end of the book, you know that in the end, that there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more death. So clearly right. that is not the case. So what, what could this mean, shortly come to pass? If you read in the Greek, if you guys haven't, haven't already heard of this amazing free tool, the blueletterbible.com, I encourage you, to check it out uh, you see I just clicked on the tools button right here next to Revelation 1 and I can see the Greek that it was written in and I can go down here to where it says things which must shortly come to pass and I can see what these words mean and uh, it, it just means quickly or speedily you know quickness and speed 
So not necessarily soon, but things that when they do happen, they're going to happen very quickly, you know, with speed. So that is another way to interpret it. And like a woman in travail. Right, right. Yeah, nine months. And then once the labor pains come, you know, the baby is delivered in a day or two, right? Yes. So, yeah, I think we're, we've been in labor pains for a long, well, we've been in, in the pregnancy for a long, long time, right? And everybody's waiting for 2,000 years saying, this is the generation, this is the generation, and everybody has their justification. And I think that, that that's important to live like any day, you know, would be our last, right? Right, yeah. To live in expectation and, and hopes that, you know, salvation will come riding on, on a white horse, you know, riding coming with the clouds in heaven. Uh, I think that that is important, right? We're told woe to those who long for the day of the Lord because it's darkness, right? And his wrath is going to be poured right. out, and that's true. We do know that the Lord is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's that's true. Somebody in the chat is is sharing um, grave, grave, grayified. I think was his name. Grayified is talking about why is why does this world suck so bad, right? And like I totally understand how you feel. This this <laughs> world yeah. really we all go through so many pains so much struggling temptations trials persecutions we're hungry all the time we have to drink all the time we have to sleep all the time like there are all of these this bondage in the flesh right and right like he's sharing his his uh, son has down syndrome like we all have specific struggles and and it it really is mm. painful so just don't feel alone, brother. I know you're saying that you feel, you know, defeated and like every day ends in defeat. But just know that even though today might end in defeat, you have ultimate victory. And that's what we have to keep yes. our eyes focused on. So we see here that the things that are going to come to pass in Revelation will come very quickly. So Revelation 1-2, it says, who bear the record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So John here, we see revelation is given to the Messiah by Elohim, as Justin Mack pointed out, Elohim being, in my opinion, the unseeable, unknowable, infinite, infinite creator that's beyond any embodiment, but then... Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, is is the flesh embodiment of that unknowable, unseeable God because he created this creation to interact with us, right? To have fellowship with us, to be our friend, to receive love from us. That's why he gave us free will too. So we see that the infinite, unknowable, unseeable God gave to the incarnate Word this revelation, and now he sent it and signified it by his angel to John. And John is now bearing record of the word of God. Who is the word of God? We know that is the Messiah. Well, the word was made flesh, and that's the Messiah, right? And of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all yes. things which he saw. So moving on. Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Another another verse that kind of makes you think, oh, maybe the predator's got it right, right? The time is at <laughs> hand. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Uh, well, you know, it for those of us, it means like suddenly uh, at hand, any time occurring, um, uh, perpetuity that, you know, it's here now. Uh, ready to be resolved uh, but you know of course looking into the greek uh, you'll get more um insight so I mean, you've got the blue letter 
Bible pulled up. I just pulled it up to uh, near a place and position. Those are near access to God. The term the to make is nigh at hand. It's yes, interesting. I, think right? I actually pulled up the wrong thing. I think they you had it right. You're reading the just, outline. Yeah. The biblical usage. I was just reading. Uh, part okay. Of the uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Thing. Yes. Right. But you know, again, mm-hmm. the thing with uh, Peter, he said the uh, a day is as uh, with the Lord a thousand years. And so even though we put things into a short and very quick um, duration with the Lord, you know, you know, a day is as a thousand years. So what is very quick for us is something that is not as uh, fast occurring uh, in the grander scheme of things. And so we have to really consider that as well and then the the whole thing with the you know the preterist and looking at the entire book of revelation we also see that at the end when the wrath of god is poured out on those not written into the book of life we have uh, the earth and the heavens being remade and then new jerusalem descends out of the heavens and comes here to the earth and it is on the recreated earth that the bridegroom comes uh, and the bride is caught up and then it is here on the earth that we reign with him, God willing, for the thousand years of that millennial reign, uh, for that Sabbath rest, uh, the seventh day of the thousand years of the Sabbath rest. And so, you know, the, the preterists, um, and, and I know there's, there's a lot of people that are speculating and considering, but in my opinion, examining the fullness of the scripture uh, and especially when you read a lot of the other material that is also focused on the end times like second Esdras and others uh, all the books of the grant commission three uh, that it, undoubtedly you know the antichrist is revealed before the return of the messiah and the new world order comes to power uh, and you know all of that happens and, and that the Messiah returning is also uh, part of, and the destruction of the earth and the heavens, that is all part of what occurs, too, before the millennial reign. Yeah, really good points. So I, I definitely agree that Revelation has not been completely fulfilled. But I, I think right. maybe what we could take from this verse is that it even began at this time, you know, that yeah. maybe some of the things that were written in Revelation did get fulfilled in the early yes. church age. Not to right, say that right. all of it was fulfilled, certainly not. But, uh, right. you know, we see the papacy come to power, right? We, we see right. that the little horn stand up, potentially, yes. you know. So these are different yeah. ways to interpret it. I don't want to be too dogmatic things, about things because I myself, I just like to study as many perspectives as possible on each of the verses. As possible, absolutely. And then let the Holy Spirit show if, yes. if the Holy Spirit wants to reveal something that's to me, then I'll accept it. I don't want to be dogmatic on my own account, though. Right. But I, yeah, but definitely... certainly the, the temple was destroyed you know mm-hmm. later he said mm-hmm. not one stone remain upon another uh, and that was fulfilled after uh, the messiah's you know after his death and crucifixion in, in 70 a.d that that was uh, fulfilled with the roman destruction of the the second temple mm-hmm. yep yeah i think that was in the gospels though right i don't know if uh, it talks about the. Uh, oh yeah, the you're right. In Matthew 24, that's here right. In Revelation. Yeah, I'm thinking. But, you, all right, yeah, let's yeah. move on. So we see. Up next is verse four. It says John to the seven churches were which are in Asia. Actually, I, I forgot we had a really good question in the chat, and uh, they asked. They they just wanted to be clear. 
Is it Jesus that's giving this revelation to John? Or is it an angel? And that's actually a really important, important point. We see in verse right. 1 that it says he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And that that actually tripped me up, you know, for, for a while. And uh, I think if you go over to like Revelation 21 or 22, and uh, John bows, bows down, and then the one that is talking to him he like lifts him up and he says you know don't don't bow down to me and i'm like what you know people bowed down to the messiah and worshiped him when he was on the earth what do you mean but uh but it makes it clear right that okay this was an angel yeah right it says and i john saw these things and heard them and when i had heard and seen i fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things yeah we see that it's an angel that was sent from the Messiah to give this revelation to John. You know, right. And then he says to me, see, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Yes. Oh, yes. Very cool. Yeah, so a really, really good point, really great question. And, uh, yeah, so let's move on. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne any comments on this verse um yeah i think you know uh, we see that and it just my opinion but i believe the seven spirits are the you know those that are listed that are part of the embodiments of uh what I believe to be the Holy Spirit. And I know that these are separate and individual, but I see them as, you know, the characteristics of what is the the Holy Spirit being in the feminine aspect, the motherly aspect of the Godhead. And I do believe that um, the, you know, because it also says that even though the word was the one that uh, voiced and sang everything into being, uh, it was through and by wisdom, as is declared a lot of times in the in the scripture. And so I see that the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the uh, self-existent, pre-existent, uh, the Godhead, the only true God in the triune aspect, you know, in the Trinity. Um, but I know that some... You know, and I think you also feel different about this. Um, but I believe that as far as the the throne and the heavenly temple, that uh, the three, uh, that they are the ones that reign. And that, you know, in the, I did a, a whole article, very in-depth, um, for Noel Hadley's uh, website, uh, The Unexpected Cosmology, where I, I spoke about the, the Holy Spirit being the feminine aspect of the Godhead. And I show how, you know, in the scriptures, especially the apocryphal text, it declares as uh, declares her as being seated there with uh, the Father and the Son. And that, you know, again, they are the, the three that are reigning. And we see this also in the ascension of Isaiah. Uh, when the Son is sent by the Father and given the mission of being the redeemer the savior messiah that the the three are seated there uh, even though in the ascension of isaiah it, it does embody the holy spirit as being male um but you know again i i think clearly in the all the rest we see that the holy spirit is feminine in aspect but yeah you go ahead yeah just According to my understanding, I, I don't believe there are three different entities that are, you know, separate entities that are God. I right, right. There are three, but there are one. One, exactly. So there, in my opinion, there's no, there's no difference in the person of who the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is. In my mm-hmm. opinion, the, the unseeable, unknowable creator incarnated you know the, the word was with god 
who is mm -hmm. not embodied. He's the infinite. Everything exists within, you know, the the infinite God. But he he came into the world he created, and the word was manifest as the spirit to interact in the spiritual realm that he created, and uh, and and then the Messiah was made flesh to interact in the flesh world that he created and. Uh, what I see here in the seven spirits is, of course, you have to go back to Zechariah 4 or later on we'll see, and I think it's Revelation uh, 4 or 5, we see the vision of the heaven opened up and we see the throne and we see it's a menorah. We see a menorah. Uh -huh. And we know that in a menorah, there are seven different flames, but there's one oil. So there's set, you know, spirits are like flames, right? The, they, they say like spiritual beings are like fire. You have seven spirits, but you have one anointing oil that pours out. So that's the same reason that the Messiah is called the Messiah. It's because it literally means he's the anointed one. He's the one that mm -hmm. is the anointing oil incarnate. So I see that the, the seven spirits, in my opinion are seven aspects seven spirits that the creator interacts with or interacts through i should say not interacts with but interacts through so i want to show everyone a really great tool some people were saying oh i really uh want to get used to using this blue letter bible app it, it's such an amazing and useful tool so i want to just show you real quick something really awesome you go over here click the tools so we were looking in the interlinear, right? This is like a concordance. You can see the original Greek. You can go down and see, you know, John, two of the seven churches. And then you can see the Greek over here and you can click on the Strong's concordance link and it will give you more on each of those words. But one of my favorite tools is actually the cross references. So, um, so here we can see more about the seven spirits. And... So you, there's a lot of work that went through here to uh, to put all of this together. It's a really great resource. But, you know, Zechariah 3, 9, it says, For behold, the stone that I've laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith Yahuwah, and spell will the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So if you look on in Zechariah 4, it says, uh, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zer Zerubbabel with those seven. The seven are the seven spirits there that are mentioned. And it says, They are the eyes of Yahuwah, which run to and fro through the earth. So these seven spirits are seven, you could say, tools or seven personas. Same, same creator. Right, he's just operating through these various spirits in the world. So, really interesting to consider, and I do believe uh, that it's mentioned in Isaiah 11 exactly what the seven spirits are. You see what the seven aspects of the spirit are, and you actually see it in a prophecy of the Messiah. It says in Isaiah 11:1, 1, "There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse." and a branch shall grow out of his roots. We know Jesse was the father of David, and we know that the Messiah would come from the bloodline of David, right? Yes. So it says, and a branch, you know, if you do a word search on the branch, that is a very fruitful study. So look right. up the branch. That I mean, I think you can just, like, search up here the branch in the Bible, and you'll find some really amazing... Uh, prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. So, all right, see, you see the branch is mentioned. Isaiah knows who the branch is. And it says, And the Spirit of Yahuwah shall rest upon him. That's one. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahuwah. We see seven different aspects, and you know one of them is literally called the spirit of Yahuwah, and the others are called wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear. 
you know, I've like looked really deep into these words because to me in English, right, wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, they all seem really similar, right? But apparently they're like maybe a little bit different aspects. If, yeah. if I was able and, to look you know, at it in the Hebrew and speak ancient Hebrew, maybe that would help, right? Right. And then, you know, again, the those are uh, like roles that are also connected to the Holy Spirit, the wisdom, knowledge, and even the counselor. Because um, in John chapter 14, verse 6, I think it is, the in the older renditions, the, the, the Holy Spirit there is the paraclete which again is the feminine aspect, um, the wisdom, Sophia, which is the, you know, again, the, the Holy Spirit. But um, so, you know, I see those aspects as being connected uh, with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is also part of the Godhead, in my opinion, as well. Uh, but yeah, I love the blue letter Bible. I love all these uh, studies, you know, and the connections and the resource that you can have from utilizing. So if people have not uh, begun to really uh, explore what kind of tools you have there and the kind of resources uh, people have labored to put together there for the, uh, the Blue Letter Bible, it is an incredible, incredible tool. And I think that looking at the... Um, the context of the words that were used, the Greek in the New Testament, the the Hebrew uh, in the Old Testament, that this will really help one to better understand the, the fullness of what is actually being conveyed with a certain word or a certain scripture, a certain passage, even with uh, words that, you know, are added uh, in the English but not found there in the uh, older languages um like uh, we have uh sometimes he uh, is added like um in the genesis 126 through 28 um and god you know made man in their image or in his image the uh, word his not being there uh, different things like that so yeah looking at the the context of the original is uh, sometimes beneficial, most of the time beneficial, I would say. Yeah, and you have to be careful reading the concordance as well, because if you right. go over to tools and you look at interlinear, what you see here in, you know, it says John to the seven churches. You see John translated, exactly what John is. You see to the translated, you see seven translated, you see churches translated. But if you actually go up to the text and you read it, oftentimes it will actually be a little bit different than what the concordance shows. So you really have to actually be able to read the original. So I'm not you know, dogmatic about using the concordance as well. It is a, a, a fallible resource. You know, it's not a perfect resource, but uh, it is a great resource and it's a, a great tool to be able to use. Uh, in in conjunction with being able to read exactly what these words say. Because often there will be a prefix or a suffix that's not mentioned here in the, uh, in the concordance, and that can totally change the, the reading. And it can actually, you know, even though you don't see it in the explanation of the interlinear, it's actually there in the text. Sometimes, not, not all the time, you know, sometimes they definitely do add and take away you know the lying pens of the scribes we definitely have been yeah. forewarned about that but uh all right so let's move on so we see there are seven spirits which are before the throne and if, all right so I'll, I'll go back and just read grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne and from jesus christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hallelujah. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 
I mean, what a what a role here. If you read that, you know, imagine that you're like taken to the taken to the queen, right? Like the the queen of England, and and she says, "All right, come visit me, and uh, you know, wear your best suit, and I, I need you to to just come visit me in, in the Buckingham Palace." And then you go and you visit the queen, and then she says. You know, as you're eating your meal, she comes with a sword and places it on your shoulder and does this ritual and says, I now knight you, right? Like, in the earth, it would be a pretty big deal, right? But here God mm -hmm. is saying that he has made you a king and a priest. Is that amazing? It is, absolutely. You've been made into Melech. You know, you've been, yes. you've been brought into that Melchizedek order through, through the blood of the Messiah. I don't know if that's ever like sank in with anyone, you know? Right. That we've been made kings and priests. That's that's a really big deal. And it comes with Yes. A lot of responsibility, right? Right. If you were, if you were just a, you know, made a priest in in England or something, then maybe you would take it seriously. But hopefully, you take this even more seriously. Because how did we get this kingship and priesthood? Through the blood of the Messiah. And he really did go through that pain for us. He paid the price for our sins so that we could be grafted in to that olive tree. And so that we could get a role, a role to play in the olive tree. Not just servants, but he calls us his friends. He calls us kings and priests to serve him. How amazing is that? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's the most amazing thing. Um, because this is, you know, God, uh, the Father and the Son, uh, anointing uh, us as a creature uh, to be and to rule in his forever kingdom. And, you know, and I think that those that have been tried and that do become and are numbered with the elect, that he realizes that they can handle taking on this role and that they will be in the re reflection and the example of himself, you know, as being a righteous, compassionate um, just God, uh, sovereign ruler, um, that, you know, we would be, uh, God willing, of course, uh, numbered with the elect and in similar disposition so that, you know, cause it writes about all throughout scripture, how the judges, the rulers, how they should be compassionate and just and, uh, in their authority over the people. Uh, and like a shepherd, you know, should rule over uh, and watch over, take care of a flock um, and not just rule in impunity and for uh, one's own benefit, self-gratification, rather than in taking care of and, you know, as Christ exampled, as a foot washer unto humanity. Uh, to bend the knee, to be in humble service, to even be willing to die and give one's life um, for another. Which is exactly yeah. what the Messiah did for us. Absolutely. And, and Justin Mack shared, you know, it, it's going to be made real when the Messiah returns in the millennial age. You know, you're, you're going you're gonna to see that priesthood and kingship come to life, right? But I, I believe even now, the kingdom of God is here. The Messiah said it when, when he came to the earth. 
that the whole kingdom of God is here on the earth now. It's not a physical yes. kingdom, right? I mean, I guess with our bodies, we are the physical pillars of the kingdom on the earth right now. But we do we have that role even in, in his kingdom even now, even though he doesn't he hasn't you know brought down New Jerusalem out of heaven yet. His kingdom is still here. You still, yeah. you know, we still have that that authority. We should have that authority, right, to operate in His kingdom. And because of that, it's, it's with that recognitions that recognition that the enemies, the spiritual enemies, will flee. They will flee when you proclaim mm. the name of the Messiah. Right. Right. right? Yes, because it's in that name that we have authority uh, over them. Absolutely. All right, so we have a few more minutes. you want me to read through one more verse? Yeah, sure. All right, right this, is, this is a pretty interesting one. It says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so... Amen. Amen. This is a big verse, right? First you see him right. coming with the clouds of heaven. And we know that it's not just water clouds, right? This is right. this is a multitude of what some people believe are angels and some people believe are the are the saints. You know, saints, they're, yeah. they're coming back with him. It says, And Amen. every it's eye both. shall yeah. see him, and they also right. which pierced him. Right. So this is an interesting line, right? And it definitely, right. you know, this is definitely, in my opinion, talked about more in Zechariah 12. Yes. Right? And it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for, for his firstborn. I got to point out that this is the Father Yahuwah speaking, right? And the Father yes. Yahuwah says, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Yes. Hold on. Amazing. Hold on. We'll be right back, everyone, for a second hour. As a bookstore for truth seekers, it's our goal to make ancient manuscripts which were once held captive by secretive institutions available for public consideration. In our generation where wisdom has increased as Daniel the prophet foretold, we have access to many of the testimonies our early church brethren were persecuted for preserving. After being hidden for centuries, these manuscripts have been leaked from various sources throughout the earth, and it's our goal to gather these sources into printable form to make available for all who seek the ancient way. If you're looking to deepen your studies of the biblical narrative, find these ancient manuscripts and more at sacredwordpublishing.com.
Your partnership with Sacred Word Publishing goes further than the publishing of ancient manuscripts and weekly video content. You also make a huge impact across the earth in orphanages in Myanmar, India, Uganda, and Kenya. Your support is crucial for the development of the Ecclesia of Real Truth Seekers. We thank you for joining us in hosting Secrets Revealed, Momentary Zen, the Digital Readers Club, Ask Me Anything series, and other shows that have helped lead so many to the truth of salvation. To become even more involved, please visit patreon.com slash sacredwordpublishing where you can partake in exclusive, interactive, patron-only content and help us continue shining the light of love in this darkened world. Are you awake yet? I hope. We've tried and we've tried for years and years to use passive resistance and loud voices to make a change. The time is over. Your governments around the world have no other goal than to decimate your entire existence. At the hands of the bankers and the elites. The war is coming. And it's your choice to decide if you want to be a warrior or a victim. Denial is not a choice anymore. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the planet. Not giving up. Revolution Radio. Radio, radio, radio. Thanks for listening while we took that short break here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. All right. Welcome, All right. Back, welcome everybody back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia, and I'm joined by my son, Justin James Garcia. We are doing a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study of the book of Revelation, and we will be continuing ongoing, uh, you know, till we complete the study. And we will also be including other um, books that are in similarity, tied in parallel with this particular revelation. So I'll turn it back over to you, son. All right. So before the break, we were discussing how the world would see the one who was yes. pierced, right? And uh, in Zechariah 12, 10, the father says, they shall look upon me, me whom they have pierced. Interesting statement, right? Right. So it kind of brings to mind that the word was made flesh, right? The word yes. was made flesh. The father was made flesh. But then it goes on to say, and they shall mourn for him. Why would they look at me whom they've pierced, but then mourn for him? Who is him? Well, him is the Messiah, right? As one yes. mourneth for his only son, the only right. begotten of the Father, mm -hmm. and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So that's, that's interesting, right? Uh, oh yeah, that we see on the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, which I believe is controlled by the synagogue of Satan right now. Yes, I agree. but they 
they will be given the spirit of grace and supplication. You know, and they're going to they're going to see the Messiah when he returns and they're going to be bitter. And what does Revelation say? It says and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Right? So, yes. you know, when he returns a great majority of the people that are left, you know, on the earth, they're going to realize, oh, man, he was real all along. Right. Maybe I should have uh, repented sooner, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe I should have repented at all, because I guess at this yeah, point, I believe at this point, I believe it's too late, right? Because this is after yes. the resurrection. Right. This is right. after the, the rapture, you know, the, Yes. We're told those who are dead rise first, and then those who are alive and remain, then they're caught up in the clouds. And so shall they ever be with the Lord, right? And they're caught up in the clouds. It's funny, it's mentioned here. Behold, he comes yeah. with the clouds. Who are the clouds? Right. Maybe it's yes. prayerfully, Yah willing, through his grace, it'll be us, right? That's prayerfully, exactly. it will be us. So... My understanding is that everyone that's left on the earth is going to receive the end of his sword, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it makes sense yes. why they're going to be crying. They're going to be waiting. All right. All right. And it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. So we see the Messiah here is called Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And I, I have to just point this out again, that the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, Aleph, the beginning Tav, and yeah. the end, this is something that the Father said. And I think it was Isaiah 42. Let me see if I can find it a cross-reference. Alpha and Omega. All right, I, I was wrong. It was 40... 43 and 44, where it says, Thus saith Yahuwah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. So interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. Got to go back to John 1 again. John knew exactly right. what he was writing when he wrote. Yes his dissertation on the word, right? In John chapter one. Right. As right. we've talked about a hundred times, you read through the Targum, which is what they're reading yes. from, or what they're exactly. studying from in, in the synagogues, the word was very right. well known, and the word was made flesh. Right. And you know, it's not the flesh of the Messiah that we worship, right? It's just right. the fact that the anointing is in that body. The, the person of the creator is in the body of the Messiah. And we're respecting the Father. You know, I mean, he was worshipped when he was on the earth. You know, and it says yes. here, Thus saith Yahuwah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Yes. Who, what, what does this mean? Yahuwah Sebeul. Lisa and Noble, they're probably correcting my, my pronunciation, <laughs> right? But the Lord of hosts, this literally means the, the Lord of heavenly armies. What are we reading from? What did we just read that the Messiah is going to return right. with, the, with the clouds of heaven, the, the armies of heaven? So we see the Lord of hosts is the same, you know, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. It says it here in Isaiah 44. Right. Thus saith Yahuwah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahuwah Sebeul. It Are these two different entities? I mean, it says, and, right? And his Redeemer which is named Yahuwah Sebeul, he said that he'd put his name in him, right? right? I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. How interesting is that? Yes. So beautiful to uh, to be able to study the prophecy with you all. So, right. all right. Uh, did and you how want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, again, and I think it's so very important that uh, people examine the Targum, because it becomes so clear 
that the word of the Lord is accounted and alluded to so many times, 217 times in the first five books of the Pentateuch alone. And all of this has been removed purposely. It's not accidental that you have 212 times uh, allusion to the word of the Lord in Scripture suddenly disappeared. I mean, that doesn't happen by coincidence or accident or, you know, it, it, it shows that there was an organized effort to scrub the Messiah, the word of the Lord, the, the logos, the, uh, the memra from the ancient scriptures so that you know, he is not associated with the Father and is not known as Savior Messiah. Because, again, the lying pen of the scribes, the rabbis, those Talmudists, those that denied him, uh, they, in my opinion, are the ones that put forth the effort to change and to alter scripture in order to deceive and to lead astray those that would read and study later. And it's only by the grace of God that we have preserved the, you know, the Targum, which means translation, the Aramaic translation of the original Hebrew Torah, uh, and that we have an English translation of that translation. So that in studying and reading it now, which it only became available in 1869 with the work of J.W. Etheridge, who was a linguist and had an interest in extra biblical manuscripts, that this translation was made available uh, and for modern scrutiny that we can now contemplate, read, and also re-interject uh, what was originally there and what, you know, was clear and obvious to the original uh, Ecclesia and to the apostles and those that were on the earth with the Messiah at that time and what, how it was that you know, they recognized him as King and Lord and as Savior and Messiah uh, in the same way that we now realize. And that, you know, in your work in bringing forth and restoring all of that information, it, people in studying and reading that, uh, the book on the word of the Lord and seeing those, you know, those scriptures conveyed and restored in the manner that um, the original, the the Hebrews, the uh, Israelites had in that day and age. I mean, it's so deeply profound. And that's why it's so important that people read and study the Targum uh, because it will give you uh, a fullness of understanding, a discernment which helps you to realize without doubt how the Father and the Son are one, and even how the name of the Father, uh, behold the hand, behold the nail, points to the Son, and then the name of the Son, Yahushua, Yah's salvation, points to the Father. And, you know, this is again revealed, and when you have this discernment in so many passages, even that which we are studying now. Yeah, it's a really great point, and uh, I love how their names point to one another, right? It's And we'll, yeah. we'll see the Father's name mentioned here uh, later on. I think maybe it's a couple chapters from now. But um, it, it is important to remember that the Word did pre-incar—pre— pre, uh, I forgot the word that I'm looking for. The Word was before the incarnate Word, right? So yeah. the word existed before what we know as the Messiah was born. Right. You know, the, the anointing that was in the Messiah, the, the word Messiah, Mashiach, means the anointed one. That anointing, the word, is the interactive component of the infinite, unknowable, unseeable creator. And that's yeah. what was in... The Old Testament and in the Targums, you see the word is is put there 
anytime the father is interacting with humanity or with his creation, he does so through the word. Yeah. So I guess it's just a concept, you know, that that was <laughs> like lost, that the father really interacted with creation, you know? Because in the Jews' mindset, if the father's interacting with creation, he must have a person, you know, like a, a personage that he has manifested into. You know, if if he's really one of the angels that went and and saw Abraham, that means that our creator is in the flesh. And then that would mean that maybe those Christians, they have <laughs> something right. So, you know, definitely we got to take that out. You know, we, we don't want that like concept really, you know, sticking. We don't right. want the Jews who read John chapter one to really get what he's saying there. I think they've done, they've done a terrible, terribly good job at, at hiding at best. Somebody asked earlier in the chat, what was our opinion on the Targum versus the Masoretic text? And this is a really good point as well, a good question and, and something that goes right along with this point that we're talking about. If you read in the Masoretic text, Psalm 22, 16, I believe it is. Psalm 22, let me, let me pull it up. Psalm 22, if you haven't already, read this. Read this a hundred times. I'll just read this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, this is a Psalm of David, and it's a prophecy of the crucifixion. We know that. We know that. We know the Messiah cried out, you know, these words on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was quoting the psalmist here when David is given a vision of the crucifixion. And David's like questioning, like, I, I don't understand. Why, why are you forsaking me? And he, and he knows he is seeing a vision of the Messiah, and he is asking, God, why are you forsaking the Messiah? Why are you forsaking the anointed one? You know, your, your anointed one, you in the flesh. Why would you forsake yourself? And he gives it an amazing prophecy of the crucifixion. I mean, it, it describes so many things. It, it, it literally describes crucifixion to a T. It talks about how they would pierce his hands and his feet. It talks about how they would cast lots for his garments. And, uh, it, you know, it talks about how he would be thirsty, of course. And then one of the really interesting points is that it says, and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. So, you know, I am poured out like water. We know when, when people were crucified, the way that they die was through They would they would uh, suffocate, and uh, when you suffocate, yeah. the pericardial fluid mixes in with your blood, and it looks a little watery. And you know it says, "My heart is like wax," and when he was pierced, he he was poured out like water. And one of the crazy things that's mentioned here: all my bones are out of joint. What does that mean? Well, when you're on the cross and you're hanging. You use up all your strength to the point where you have no more strength. You know, if you're being held up and you're totally limp, right? You have no muscle holding holding your body up. Your your joints are gonna, your bones are gonna come out of the sockets because you don't have any strength to hold them in the sockets any right. longer. And that happened in crucifixion. But this is the point that I'm trying to make. Psalm 22, 16, it says, The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And I, I went through and I looked in Targum of Psalms, uh, the Greek Septuagint, I think the, the Aramaic Peshitta, they were like, and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, like all of these translations, they all say they pierced my hands and my feet, okay? Or they say they dug a hole through, which is you know, what we see is pierced, right? They they literally made a hole through his mm -hmm. hand right here. And um, except for the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text says, like a lion, my hands and my feet. <laughs> you see the lying pen of the scribes. I'm not saying that 
the KJV is perfect or the you know the Septuagint or anything. I don't believe that any of them are undefiled at this point in history. But I definitely think that that's wrong. That right. the Masoretic text disagrees with every other translation, and they say like a lion, my hands and my feet. And it's so unfortunate because when you go to Israel and you try to tell the Israel that well those who say they they are Jews that hey you know David prophesied about the crucifixion. Right. Look at Psalm twenty two sixteen. They'll say oh no 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 you have a mistranslation. Now, ours says like a lion my hands and my you know, like a lion my hands <laughs> and my feet. And you're like what what does that mean like are you trans was david transforming into a lion like no no that you know one translation says it it's like a lion that bit my hands and my feet you know and it pierced with that with the tooth like a lion it's pierced my hands and my feet but not just like a lion my hands and my feet you know so we see yeah. that and, and it's really frustrating you know i think it's so unfortunate it's so unfortunate. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, those, unfortunately, those people who say they, they are Jews are not. They are in the yes. synagogue of Satan. I'm not saying everyone in there is evil. I'm saying that they are being misled by an ancient deception, a very ancient deception. So did you want to touch on that before you move on? Yeah, I want to make mention of one thing uh that even when you look at the, and many people know this study that uh, Chuck Missler brought it forth a long time ago, and it's on the meaning of the names of the ten generations of Adam that are found in Genesis chapter 5, that when you look up the meanings of those names of the patriarchs, that Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh means subject to death. Canaan means sorrowful. Mahalil means from the presence of God. Jared means one comes down. Enoch means dedicated. Methuselah means dying. He shall send. Uh, because this was also the year when Methuselah died, the flood came. Lamech means to the poor and lowly. Noah means rest and comfort. And so when you put those 10 names together, which, you know, it's only been in recent discovery that this information and the revelation of this prophecy has come forth in the 10 names of the patriarchs from Genesis chapter 5. It means this, man appointed subject to death, sorrowful, from the presence of God, one comes down dedicated and dying. He shall send to the poor and lowly rest and comfort. And is that not exactly what the Messiah fulfilled in being the Redeemer, our Savior Messiah? This is the exact mission that he accomplished in defeating death. This is the promise of the cross and the whole mission his role uh and what he accomplished is found in the names of the patriarchs of adam's line the first 10 generations which is right. absolutely incredible all right and it's not even like it's hidden right right anyone who right. really yeah. like speaks hebrew they probably saw that maybe it was a yeah. little cryptic, they should have but... right I guess it's new for our generation, right? It was lost for yes. a long time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Diane Ashdown said, Zen, where are you finding the meaning of the names? I can show you. Uh, I'll, I can show you here. Yeah, I'll, Genesis chapter 5 in the Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible, Let's yeah. go over here. I see an Adam. All right, what does this word Adam mean? All I got to do is open up the toolbar, and it shows the interlinear. I click on the strong concordance for Adam, and then I get the definition. Man. Where is the definition? Well, it says first man and a city in Jordan Valley, but it means mankind. So, all right, we get Adam, but I guess this was like the Adam, but anyways, 
the same as I posted Adam here. The here chat. we go. All right, so it's the same as this word here. Maybe it's a little different with the uh, the Nikud attached, but it means man and mankind. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that too, Dan. I want to teach people how yes. to how to fish, right? So yes. Then you go over here them, so. and you scroll down. And you see Seth. All right. Let's see what Seth. His name is compensation. Same as this root word right here. Be set upon to, all right, this is what my dad said, appointed. Appointed to fix. That's a good word, too. Someone's appointed and fixed. They're going to fix it. All right, so anyways, you get the point. You can you can go through, but of course, you can follow that link that uh, my dad shared there. And people have already done it for you. And it's always interesting, you know, to be able to look at the interlinear, to look at that strong concordance and to see what the words really mean but like we said earlier you gotta be careful because as you saw there there was like a dozen words <laughs> that that word potentially could have meant but all right let me bring up one more point about the strongest concordance here uh so you just hit tools you go to interlinear because i see a lot of people in the chat are like wow you know i really like seeing this blue letter bible so hit tools at on that uh, the, alongside any of the verses in the bible and then you just click the word. And one of my favorite parts about this Strong's Concordance breakdown is that you can go down here to the very bottom, and it shows you every single time that that word was used in the scripture. Like this word was obviously used a lot because it's am or is, right? <laughs> but if you look up that, that word, the branch, and you look up that Strong's Concordance and then look at, at the very bottom of the, of the Strong's Concordance where it shows you every time that word is used, you will see some very amazing things. And sometimes I like to do a study like that. I'll look up like the word lion one time. You know, I looked up the word lion and just read every single passage that had the word lion in it. And it was it's interesting. You know, you can do word studies. All right. But anyway, shall we continue? Yes. Uh, but before we do, I want to bring up one other thing uh somebody had asked in the chat room as to uh where and if we published an english translation of the targum and indeed we have i will post a link in the chat room for that you can find it at sacred word publishing we published a aramaic and palestinian targum together where you know you have a parallel account of both uh, together so you can see the differences in what are the oldest and most uh, well-respected uh, ancient translations of the uh, you know the Hebrew Torah into what is the Aramaic uh, and so I posted that link and then also I wanted to make one other real quick uh, point that you had mentioned branch and how we know that when you look up the word for branch, you get in the, um, you know, it's basically a representation of the family tree. And that if you examine that particular, you know, do the word study, the branches um, like seed and like Zara, fruit, they are um, allusions to descendants. Uh, ancestors, lineage, you know, fruit, uh, like children. Um, and it's interesting that when you look up in Isaiah chapter 14, um, it, it, you know, which is about uh, Lucifer or the day, you know, the day star, uh, that word was translated by Jerome uh, as Lucifer. Um, but it is mentioned here right below where he declares how he wants to exalt himself above the stars and the clouds of God. Uh, it says um, here, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. And as the raiment of those that are slain thrust upon with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet, thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned 
prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. And then it goes, you know, later it talks about how from the serpent's root uh, shall be born a cockatrice. And so, you know, again, I think all of those are connections to Cain being of the wicked one and that the wicked one is described as the abominable branch. And so from the Messiah, you know, from we see that uh, Adam is declared to be the son of God and that his lineage is found in Genesis chapter 5. And we have the children of Cain who are the from the abominable branch, which is from Satan, and that he is of the wicked one. This 10 generations is found separated from Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 4. And so that's another interesting aspect of, you know, the word branch and doing a study on it. It's, I believe it's the, the Hebrew word netzer. Um, but you can, you know, look that up and examine it for yourself. And it's a, a very interesting study. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to mention, but I, I forget. If I remember, I'll, I'll bring it up, but I'll turn it back over to you. All right. We will continue with Revelation 1.9. We're moving pretty steadily. I think we're mm -hmm. covering like one verse every 10 minutes. We'll get through <laughs> eventually. It's important. Yes. Right? All right, so we're moving on. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia and to Ephesus and to Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. So, all right, there's a couple things to talk about. Uh, one, it says, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. So what, is, what does that mean? To most people, the Lord's Day. What what's the interpretation that you've heard of for this verse? Um, the Lord's Day, the being the the last day, the you know the the great and terrible day of the Lord when the wrath of God uh, is to be poured out. Uh, in John, if you look up um, the or, or if you search the scriptures, the last day in John uh, it comes up five times i believe um and the you know again it's allusion to the great and terrible day of the lord but uh that's just my opinion i think that you're pretty spot on right this is a lot of people will say oh he was he was in the spirit on the sabbath day or on the day that they celebrate the the resurrection on sunday right but I, I believe this is, he was taken to the millennial age, the Lord's day. You know, it says a day yes. with the Lord is as a thousand years with thousand man. Years. So he was taken to the millennial reign is what I believe. And uh, then mm -hmm. he is told in a vision all the things that are, you know, proceeding up to this, this point. And uh, all right, so he's in, this is really important to, to note the timing that he's at. He's in the spirit in the millennial reign. He's like fast forwarded to the future. He's seeing the future, right? Yes. All right and, then he, and then he hears behind him a great voice as of a trumpet. That's pretty interesting to consider as well, right? The voice, yes. it's like a trumpet. And I'm really interested. Let's, let's see what this word It's like a trumpet. And it literally, it just means trumpet. I don't know if I could understand that language, but you know, the Holy Spirit will give you the power 
to speak in tongues and you'll be able to understand languages that you normally wouldn't. And I definitely wouldn't understand the language that was like a trumpet, right? <laughs> but how amazing right. is that to, to just consider that? Just think about that. He hears a voice as of a trumpet. All right. Have you ever heard of like the, the resonance of stars? Yes. You know what they sound like? They sound yeah. like musical instruments, right? Right. Like yes. the, we in the flesh, we have these physical mouths. So like uh, we like make these sounds and this is the language that we speak, right? But like the language in the heavens potentially is is music. You know how yes. how beautiful is that to yeah, consider? Incredible, beautiful, yeah. Yeah. All right, so moving on, it says, saying I'm Alpha and Omega. All right, we see here again, Alpha and Omega. Who is this? This is the Father and his Redeemer, as we were told in Isaiah 40, 43, right? 43 and 44. Yes. All right, so uh, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. All right, so this is important. I believe, you know, John was told, write write these messages to the seven churches and send it to the seven churches. And those churches were there at that time in modern day Turkey, you know, around around that area in uh, east or western Turkey. I believe, you know, potentially this message is important for those seven churches at that time, right? Mm -hmm. But also, we can learn something by reading the messages that was sent to these seven churches. I'm not sure if you can, you know, a lot of people are like, yes, America is Laodicea, you know, the, I don't know, Philadelphia is somebody else, whatever. But I don't, I don't think that I can't at least understand how there would be seven churches on the earth right now. Right, right, right. Right? You know, a lot of us yeah. will identify with one church or another, but right. I, I really... I don't know. I don't know. So let's. Oh, did you want to uh, comment on that before we move on? Yeah, I think uh, you know the churches now um, are the the people and the and these are characteristics. Whereas it had been you know associated to uh, the churches in that day, that it's you can't generalize a particular nation as being one of these churches because i don't believe it's uh geographic or demographic like like that it's um speaking of characteristic you know characteristically how the believers are and non-believers uh, which what is why you know the church of philadelphia uh is considered to be since they were uh were those that had uh fulfilled and completed you know, in ideology, the what a believer should be, that they were spared and, from the wrath. And this is uh, said to be associated with those that would actually be raptured in the, the time of when, because uh, we see also the association of the trumpet. And I believe that the trumpet is a signification of the seventh trump, which I believe, um, you know, Yom Terah, that we the messiah returns on the feast of trumpets and that you know the, it is when the trumpet is blown that um the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our lord and then the wrath of god is poured out on the wicked you know those that as you said um are sorrowful and in woe because they know that they have been left behind and they were not true in their faith. And many of them, not only, you know, being deniers and non-believers, but um, many of them even mocked God or the existence of God or the role of Messiah uh, and that salvation being through him. They did not believe. And because of that, you know, they are not um, counted in the books of life. They're left, left behind. Yeah, it's interesting to to see, you know, this great voice that sounds like a trumpet says the, right. the, the trumpet is the voice of the Most High. And he says in that voice of the trumpet, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. 
and he's literally talking you know to yes to john with this trumpet voice and it says and i turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one likened to the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters all right uh, let's talk here we see the seven golden candlesticks this is important and this is something that i really want to encourage people if it's your first time <laughs> tammy george says it looks like i have no hair with with the, the headphones on my head yeah, that's funny i got <laughs> my hair back here back here all right anyway so you, you see symbol like symbols here see symbols being used and a lot of us have been told throughout time throughout our whole lives that revelation is too difficult for you to understand there's too much allegory, too much symbology. You, you'll never be able to piece it together, right? But the right. cool thing is, if you actually read it, it explains itself. Like every time yes. Daniel was given a really interesting and like difficult vision, if you just read the end of the chapter, he's given an explanation of it too, right? Except for a few things right. that were sealed up. And, and those things are mysteries, but... The majority of it is explained. So, all right, here we see there are seven golden candlesticks. What are these candlesticks? We'll find out later. Church. We'll find out later, yeah. Well, you, you've read ahead, but spoiler all right. alert. <laughs> all, right. all right, so, and then in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, we know who this is. Yes. The same Son of Man that Daniel saw. Yes. The same Son of Man that Ezekiel saw. When he was in Ezekiel 1, given a vision of the throne of the Most High, and he saw one like the Son of Man sitting on the throne, standing on the, on the throne above the firmament. Amazing, right? Yes. So, all right, and he's yes. clothed with a garment down his foot, girded by the pass with a golden girdle. I mean, you, he's literally describing the king, the king of kings to you. How amazing is this? You know, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. <laughs> And his eyes were like the flame of fire. All right. So maybe, you know, after he ascended into the heavenly realm in this body, he's got eyes like a flame of fire. All right. I know right. a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, this this passage right here, it says his feet are like fine brass. Have you ever seen fine brass? Like he's probably African-American, right? But I think they, they disregard <laughs> this part that says, as if they burned in a furnace. Have you ever seen brass in a furnace? It's glowing, right? right? It's glowing. Gl exactly, it's glowing yes. like his eyes were like a flame of fire. They're like glowing. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying he was or was not African American. I don't, you know, we, we have conflicting reports. A lot of what you bring forth says he was Caucasian. I don't know. I don't care personally you know he's, right. he's the king know. over all ethnicities but yes exactly. <laughs> this is just a really interesting and amazing picture that john right. is trying to describe to you i mean he's glowing is, is basically what he's yes. saying it's like he's on fire and what did yes. we learn earlier you know spirits are Angels, like entities yes. of fire, fire right exactly yeah yes. so all right we'll move on it says and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So once again, you see, he's glowing. And in his right hand, he's got seven stars. What are those? Well, stay tuned. You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> and it says in Revelation 1.17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. Is this blasphemy when he says I am the first and the last? No. Absolutely not. It's the truth. It's the absolute truth. It's the Messiah the is the exactly. incarnate word, is the incarnate father. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. 
and have the keys yeah. of hell and of death. Hallelujah. He, yes. His flesh body died for us. Yes. He died for us. The only worthy sacrifice in all of creation. The only yes. worthy sacrifice was the creator himself in the flesh. And his body, yes. his body was brought forth the life out of the virgin. He died on the cross. And he defeated death. He has the keys of hell and of death. You know, he broke he broke the gates open. What was that the Gospel of Nicodemus? You can read more about that. Was I right about that? The Gospel of Nicodemus yes. or Barnabas? Yes, Gospel of Nicodemus right. and the Gospel of Bartholomew. Bartholomew. And the Gospel of Barnabas, too. So awesome. Yes. All right. So and it says, and he's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. That is absolute. Yes. Truth. He is infinite, of course. He is infinite. He's alive forevermore. He is the creator, you know? The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Like, I can't comprehend, you know, whatever. He's infinite, right? Like, he's alive forever, infinitely. So if, if you've studied calculus at all or studied the concept of infinity, <laughs> there is no beginning or end in infinity. So basically, he's just saying when he says he's the beginning and the end, he says he is everything. Yes. From as far this way to as far this way as you can go, he encapsulates everything. He is the infinite creator. There is nothing beyond him. There is nothing that he cannot control. Death could not hold him. Of course not. Yeah. And it says, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter all right so this is an important line it says write the things which you have seen all right past the things that are in present time so i i believe this was he's still in the lord's day right he, yes. he's seeing like the beginning or somewhere in the thousand year reign and then also he sees things that happen after the thousand year reign and i think that's one of the most like confusing parts for me is reading through and trying to keep in mind is there anywhere that the millennial age is mentioned in the seven trumpets or the seven seals or the seven bowls or is it just in revelation 2021 that we see details about the timing of the millennial age you know it's not super clear but Right. When we read verse by verse, maybe we'll be able to see some precepts. You know, I always like to say reading the Bible right. is like watching a movie. When we were kids, you know, you when when we were kids, there weren't new movies coming out. You know, five times a day, it was like you okay. get a good movie, you get a, a recording of it, and then you watch it like twenty or thirty times. Some of them maybe a hundred <laughs> yeah. times, and every time you watch it, you learn a little bit more, right? You yes, piece together yes. like something that you didn't catch the first time. You're like, oh, I didn't catch up the first time. It's like the movie actually got a little bit better every time you watched it because you understood yes. it more. It's the same thing here. The more you right. read it, the more you're going to see what the Bible calls precepts. Precepts. And they they go together. You know, Daniel prophesied about a lot of the same things that you'll see here in Revelation. Isaiah prophesied a lot about the same end times that Jeremiah did and Ezekiel did. You know, and, and they all were given these precepts and they all either line up directly next to each other, like verse on verse, or they're like right here, like stacked one after the other. And you can build up a greater understanding of the timeline. I don't have a perfect understanding of it, but, you know, the more we study, the, the more will be revealed, you know, the more diligent, the more right. work we do, the more we're going to learn. So... I think it's awesome that we're able to join together on this journey with everyone. It's such a blessing, and I'm really, really glad to uh, to be able to have this awesome family. So we have one more, yes, one yes. more verse here, and this was, you know, spoiler alert. If you didn't know what the golden candlesticks or the the seven stars in his hand were, this is where you find out. Oh, and just read to the end. It'll it'll explain itself to you. It says, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. So who's speaking now? This is the Messiah speaking. 
which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. All right, so he's commanding them, right, with his right hand. He's got these seven candlesticks, which are the angels, oh, sorry, the, uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And then we see the seven candlesticks, which you saw, are the seven churches. So presumably, John's here in the millennial age, right? He doesn't just see yeah. a candlestick. He literally sees, like, the whole congregation, potentially, right? I'm not really... Right. I'm not totally certain on that, but I'm just kind of getting a picture here. Did he literally just see a menorah? You know, seven different flames, seven different churches, all connected with one anointing, right? Yes. The full embodiment. Yeah, seven candlesticks. So this is this is an important symbology to keep in mind as well. When we go later on, when we see... The two witnesses. We see that the two witnesses are referenced as two candlesticks. All right. So what does that mean? Well, we see the seven candlesticks. Candlesticks are the seven churches. It doesn't say how big the churches are. Let's look up. Let's see this word for churches and look a little deeper into it. Ecclesia. I clicked on the wrong thing there. The seven churches. It is Ecclesia, and it literally just means assembly or church. It's a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly. An assembly of people convened at the public place of the council for the purpose of deliberating an assembly of the Israelites. Any gathering or throng of men assembled by chance tumultuously in a Christian sense, it's an assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. All right, so we get the point, right? Yes. There are like seven groups of people. Right. Here, that's, and that's interesting to say. Maybe in the millennial age, maybe every single one of us do fall into that category of one of the seven churches. So I think, mm -hmm. I don't know how often we're going to be able to do this study, but, you know, Next time that we do the study, we're going to see the actual messages to the seven churches, and they all have a little bit of a, a deferring uh, problem with them, a strength to them. So maybe we all do fit into the seven churches. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, uh, yeah, I do absolutely believe so. Um, and then, you know, again, that these seven churches, rather than being seven real churches, are a representation of the fullness of the the believers and non-believers you know that uh, we're all in different um, points in our walk of faith uh, and you know working out our our faith and fear and trembling as the scriptures say so yeah all right well that brings us to the end of revelation chapter one and i know we just have a few minutes left and i guess i just want to say i appreciate everybody for joining in on the live stream thanks for having me on the show i'm really convicted to do more you know with yeah absolutely. taking, taking we'll, we'll on definitely you know that rob rob and you did such amazing shows you know rob had such an amazing right mission and ability you know i'm sure i would love to hear you and him do this show you know and i'm sure like everybody right. here also agrees with me that man i would love to hear what he had to say about all these right yes yes but us yes, doing absolutely. this studying us doing this studying one verse at a time eventually we're going to be able to, to speak at the same level that rob would have spoken to us now we just got to got to start here and uh with fresh eyes and i appreciate you sharing you know your studies and uh hopefully you guys have learned something and and you've been blessed through this study i'm really excited to continue on yes me as well and and we're not you know trying to replace 
what Rob and I had done in the um, in the previous uh, the Genesis and the Book of Enoch. Um, but we are, you know, trying to in the spirit of uh, truth and discernment and what he and I did as seekers of truth uh, to bring forth that. And you know, my son is very knowledgeable on the scripture as well and has read much of what I have in as far as the extra biblical books. I really I don't know anybody that has read as much of the extra biblical texts uh, as he has. Um, and you know it's because a lot of that we put together and made available in, for public consideration in the um, books that we've made available for all of you at sacredwordpublishing.com. And because we've been doing the Digital Readers Club for how many years and months and weeks now, and we've read through a lot of that material. And a lot of this is, you know, stuff that most people have never had chance to read. And so uh, I couldn't see a, a better person uh, to, to join me in doing this. And so I appreciate uh, your willingness and your I eagerness it. and... Yeah, and I look forward to great, continuing it. A great bonding exercise, father son duo. But yeah, we're yeah, absolutely. We, we could never replace Rob, of course, and that's not. No, we're just course, taking. That's not our point. We're just carrying forth the mission that that he was on. You know, we're yes. all we're all fellow servants in the kingdom of the Most High. Yeah, a lot of people yes. are saying, please do this once a week. I would be willing to. I'm, <laughs> I'm not really sure. Uh, what my we'll do it when we can. Like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, if I start doing too many shows, my mm -hmm. voice gives out. And uh, right, the reason so that we, you, we you have... and Rob were able to do it was because he had a midnight show, right? And right, that wasn't right. that didn't take up any of your schedule. It was just an extra show right. that you did. Right. But uh, our right. our normal shows, I think, are like booked. Yeah, Wednesday like, and Thursday. Yeah. yeah. But we'll we'll make it a point wherever we can mm -hmm. to start including uh, these studies into what we bring forth, uh, you know, periodically. Yeah. So we remember, right. and we will do that. Thanks for having me. God Thank bless you, everybody. All. We love you all. Love you. Love y'all. Be blessed, all. Good night. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this video and this broadcast. We appreciate all of you, and thank you for your patronage. Please do like and subscribe and share with your friends. God bless all of you in your seeking.